And while you're standing, I just want to welcome in the people that are joining us online. Welcome to Causeway this morning. We've got two very special guests from Australia, uh, Jeff and Lee Blight from Life Church in Brisbane. And uh, Jeff and Lee pastor the North Campus, and they've got a great team that look after the South Campus. So, uh, Causeway, would you welcome those joining us online this morning? Come on. Cool. Grab a seat. So Lee, it's just, I don't, I don't know how long we've known you guys. We came over to your church and to your conference and it's just a great, great church. You've got great people and I know you're enjoying the uh, Winterless North at the moment um, from Brisbane. Hey, it's fantastic to be here and I'll just chuck on some Aussie accent for you. <laughs> No, but it's so wonderful. We just count it such a privilege and a joy to be friends with Colin and Anne and, um, and your team, your ministry team are amazing as well. And we've really loved over the years getting, having the opportunity to get to know them. And, um, and just to be in this house, like the church across the, the globe, you know, you can find where people are like-minded and like in faith and believing for all the things that we can be doing on the earth to share his love and, and faith. And we find that in this house, which is great. And it's been amazing, um, you know, just to watch the miracle unfolding across this place with your facility. Honestly, it's just brought so much excitement to us, to our church. And we are supporting you and believing all that God is going to do through that place. Because when we have a, when we have a place that is God's house, it's a refuge for all around. So we are just cheering you on. We are believing with you and, um, and willing to support you in any way we can as well to see that. So, yeah. Cool. Give her a hand. Come on. Well, well actually, I should have, actually, I should have let you remain up here for a second. Sorry, I'm not going to. Just come back up for a second. Sorry. Sorry. Just got to wear off that the crayfish. Um, <laughs> These guys uh, generously sewed into our um, offering um, earlier this year, the Build a House offering. And uh, so I, I just wanted to say publicly, thank you. Uh, they sewed $20,000 uh, into our offering. And their guest speaker that night, who I got to meet for the first time on s Monday night, uh, Pastor Joel Cave, they chucked in another 20. So, so um, you can just keep doing that. We'll be happy. And... Um, <laughs> And so, come on, let's just, let's just thank them. And it's their church. Thanks, Lee. It's all yours, bro. Well, guys, does this work? Can you hear me? Come on. I just want to tell you how incredibly excited I am about what is happening here in Mangawai. Firstly, what you do in this hall every single week is extraordinary what you've been doing for a couple of years now in this hall. That's a bit of an exaggeration, under whatever. It's ironic. Um, it's so amazing. You guys, sometimes when we're in the middle of it, we don't realise, but you are stewarding a miracle right now. And uh, what this church just, this church is a miracle in this community. What you are building just up the road is an extraordinary breakthrough miracle, a generational impact miracle. You need to understand how incredibly exciting it is, and you get to be here to be part of this. And in generations to come, people are going to look back at you bunch and go, they are the people who saw us step into the promised land. And they, you've been led by two fantastic people. There they are. Um, just tremendous couple, Colin and Anne, and in, down to earth, connect with the town, taking a massive step of faith in in sync with you guys. I'm so excited. Life Church is so excited to support you and to be here. I've been disappointed I haven't been able to get here just to sort of be around the miracle. But uh, we've had some travel limitations. I'm not sure that New Zealand was really happy to have me this time. <laughs> had to stick something up my nose to come and then something up to my nose once that I did come. I'm not sure what they're meant to do now. But uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't hear that, that's sad for you. <laughs> it's fantastic. But um, I really am very excited to be here. We're very excited to be here. We're thrilled to be with Colin and Anne. We did go fishing yesterday. We didn't catch any fish, but at least it was cold. <laughs> so that was, that was good. But uh, no, it's just great to hang out. It's great to be here. And if us being here and our partnership... You know, just 
You've got some people on the other side of the ditch that really love you guys and are very excited about what God is doing here and excited about where this is going. You need to understand, you're not just building a building so you don't have to come here. You're building a building to impact generations. So what we're doing is creating a legacy that just bounces past us. I think, I'll murder this phrase, but it's something like wise men plant trees under whose shade, which shade they'll never sit. And we all want to do that. We want an echo of our life that goes past our life. Um, so excited. When Colin was talk- has been talking to us about it all the way through, I'm thinking, oh, which- this is just such an exciting time for this church and such an exciting thing to be part of. We literally get to do this. We get to shape generations. And um, so I'm very, very excited about that. I want to talk to you today. Uh, you know, apparently you've been just doing the looking at really the fundamentals of our faith of late. And at Life Church in Brisbane, we've been doing very much the same sort of thing. Our theme this year is Jesus. We call it the one. And then our theme for the summit is the one, but we're talking about the one person. So we're, we're here to follow the one Jesus, whose passion is for the one. We need to understand how incredibly um, passionate about one person Jesus is. You know, all through his life, he's catching up with one leper, one lame person, one ostracized woman, one just so much of the Gospels is Jesus with the one. But, uh, you know, in, in this, and it's an ambiguous season that we're in, you know, it's very hard to work out how do we walk as representatives of Jesus. And, uh, and so we've been focusing on the one. And, you know, as we run after Jesus, there's some great keys for us to finish well. And, and finish well or just run the race that God has for us. I'm not suggesting we need to finish too quickly. But you understand that there's lots of starters. There's not many finishers. And for us to finish well, what we need to do is not carry stuff we don't need to carry. So today I want to talk about travelling light. And we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12, the first couple of verses of Hebrews chapter 12, which I really love. Um, It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance. The race that God has set before us. We do this, how? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, who is the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy waiting for him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and is now seated at the place of honour before, beside God's throne. Um, years and years ago, long, long time ago, I can still remember. Uh, and the music used to make me smile. Yep. I'm swear if I had my chance. Anyway. Um, me and my friend Steve decided to go for a, a, you call it tramping, we don't use that word in Australia, it's not appropriate, but um, (laughs) we decided we'd pack our packs and we'd go hiking up Kangaroo Valley, up along the creek there, that was the plan, and we only packed what was absolutely essential. We were really careful about that. When we got there, we got our packs on our back, we walked 150 metres, we set up camp and that's where we stayed. Because apparently everything that was essential hindered us from getting where we had to go. And so we packed everything that was essential to set a tent up three metres from the creek and just sit there and tell lies for a whole weekend. And uh, that was fantastic. Uh, We had a great time. Um, But sometimes we're carrying stuff that we really think we need to, but we don't really need it. Uh, A few years ago, we had an opportunity as a family to go and visit some of Europe. So we took our boys before they sort of stepped into their next season or adult season. And we were, you know, we walked around Paris and we walked around London and we walked around Venice, which was like, whoa, that's a crazy place. And um, we travelled really light. Lee likes to travel really light. So not only did I just have a carry-on, I had a little carry-on, you know. So you just need a couple of pairs of jeans, a few shirts, my delicates. Um... <laughs> And uh, we, it's good because if you're on an aeroplane, you just have to whip off the aeroplane and you're away. You don't have to wait for the baggage and you can just go everywhere. We just have to wash a lot, but that's okay. And nobody really cares as I walk around Europe whether this is the same jumper I was wearing yesterday. And, and so we we're just traveling light. It was really good, really, really good, really fun. And it really helped us. But I want to talk about traveling light today. I think sometimes in our journey of life, we're carrying stuff that we think is helpful, but it's not helpful. And when you watch, you know, the Olympics, the runners don't have too much with them. 
And that's exactly the picture that we get here. If we're going to run with endurance, we need to travel light. And the first thing is, that since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, and that is a direct reference to the chapter before, which is the, the chapter of faith, which goes through, you know, starts with God, then Abraham and David and all of the heroes of faith and a whole lot of nameless heroes of faith who still please God with their, their faith. And so what he's saying is we're, we're, we've got a crowd looking on that have run before us, but I think there's a great message there is the whole power of mentors really help us carry the load. Sometimes we can get a little bit sort of insular and sort of insecure and we're just looking in. I think it's very good to look out and see who's gone before me and who's running better now. Oh, I want to have mentors in every area of my life, but it's really especially as I run after Jesus, I need mentors. We've just been over celebrating Paul de Jong. I think the man's a hero. I used to work with him when we were in our 20s. That's a long, long time ago. I can still remember. And, um, and, and yet you know, his whole life has been marked by it. When he was in his 20s, he pulled off a massive miracle of facilities in Sydney then he come over here and look what God has done but more than just the, the, what's been achieved the, who the man is he's coming over to our summit and he's facing a big challenge going through a big challenge now and the reports are fantastic and we have the opportunity to stand in faith with him uh, I just but do I think Paul de Jong's perfect no I don't think Paul de Jong's perfect you know, in fact none of my bible heroes are very perfect you know, Abraham's the father of faith, right? And we read in, Roman, in Romans chapter 4 that he did not waver according to the promise, except that he tried to pass his wife off as his sister twice so that he didn't sort of have to get into a fight to protect her. I reckon that, that could be wavering because if he loses his wife, he loses the promise. And I don't know. I don't know. That's very cool. And, and the great thing is his son got to follow his example and did that as well. It's a great limit. So, to all you men, don't pass your wife off as your sister. <laughs> the concerning thing, of course, is that Sarah was Abraham's sister, but we're not going there today. <laughs> it's a different time. But uh, I, I look at the Apostle Paul. You know, I'm so inspired by Paul. I love his passion for the gospel. I love it. I'll be, you know, I, all things to all men, so that by all means I might win some. His passion to get stuff done, and he gave his life for it. But. He's, he's, the man, he's the preacher of grace and yet he'd written off John Mark and it was the argument over whether they should include John Mark that separated Paul and Barnabas. John Mark went on to write the Gospel of Mark. That's a fairly good achievement. Uh, he, he, a bit later in Paul's life he says, bring John Mark to me because he's useful to me for my ministry. But back then he made a bit of a blunder and I reckon Paul would have been a bit tricky to live with and, which is why, you know, he said it's a, that's why he was single. And... Uh, <laughs> If he was married, her name was Grace. <laughs> Three times I've asked the Lord to take this thorn from me. Three times he said, my grace is sufficient for you. So anyway. Um, so I think having mentors and heroes is so incredibly important. And they're not perfect, so it's not like we blindly follow them. You know, when you watch American sort of movies, the, the hero is faultless, never made, always knows the right thing to say and saves the world. Generally... If they've got a repeated theme in American movies, one man saves the world. Um, it could be Tom Cruise, he likes that. But just, our heroes aren't perfect. In fact, imperfection in the people I admire really encourages me because I know there's a bit of imperfection in me. And if God can use them, God can use me. My dad was my hero. Um, but was he perfect? He wasn't perfect. But a man of integrity taught me how to love my wife because the way he loved my mother. Um, a man of just really unshakable integrity and uh, just a good man introduced me to Jesus I remember praying with my dad in my room when I was 13 years old to to give my life to Jesus he came in and said matey sometimes I just wonder if you've ever accepted Jesus for yourself personally and um, and I remember that and I still remember that room but dad wasn't perfect I know that dad used to get a bit cranky right you've got me cranky well, you've got me mad are you happy and I'm thinking I am not happy <laughs> <laughs> so mentors lighten the load since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let's, let's run and great mentors lighten the load and you've got great mentors here on the front row are they perfect? no they're not perfect but they're faith filled they're taking a mountain you know they're leading you to take a mountain what will be achieved because of this great couple and their, their ability and their tenacity and their commitment to move forward is extraordinary the impact you are having in this town just the size of this crowd here today next to the size of the town
you're in is an extraordinary statement of faith. Your faith, thank you for everything you do in this building. Thank you for all the teams, the kids' team that are out there administering to the children. How fantastic is that? None of it happens by mistake, and I want to thank you for leaning in. But all of that leaning is made possible by a couple that are lent in. And that's extraordinary. The second thing we need about the, the passage goes on and say, let us strip off the weight that so easily entangles. I mean, I'm thinking about the weight, because he goes on to talk about sin. So the, the weight and the sin. So the weight, to, to me, is brokenness. And, and I'm aware that, as a human, I bring my brokenness to every conversation I have. You understand? Uh, I, I, wholeness is not just an option. It's really an obligation for all of us to be to be growing because as a leader I bring my brokenness to every catch up every meeting every breakfast meeting as a husband I bring my brokenness into my marriage um, as a father I just pass my brokenness on to my kids as we heard about with Abraham and Isaac and you know the great confronting thing about being a parent you hear your kids say stuff and you go oh I'm sorry <laughs> you know that's how God punishes us he just gives us kids just like us and says hey you work it out and uh but wholeness, God's called us to wholeness. Why? Because it makes a difference. It shifts stuff. It shifts stuff. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses of faith, let us strip off the weight that so easily entangles. I love this in Romans 12. It says here, So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done to you. Let them be a holy, living and holy sacrifice to the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviours and the customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Jesus, I need to change the way I think. You know, I reckon that's the biggest challenge for probably all of us is the internal narrative, the stuff that's going on in your head. And we think that because thoughts are private, they're free, but they're not free. They shape our world. And we're transformed by changing the way that we think, which is, that's where brokenness comes from. Because I start with a false argument, stronghold in Corinthians, and it shapes how I respond. See, our convictions, what I really believe about me, about God, about the universe, shapes what I value, what I see as important. And my values, they inform my decisions. And so this wholeness thing is so incredibly important. Jesus, I need to be whole. You know, we had some praise reports for, for miracles like physical healing, and that's fantastic. I love all of that. But let's thank God. Change me into a new person by changing the way I think. See, if I want to run with endurance, I need strength. Any, any athlete that's going to run a long race needs strength to go the distance. And when my strength has run out, then my endurance has stopped, right? So we, we need to understand the power. And that's the picture. Paul draws that picture again and again. And, and James, who's really, he's the brother of Jesus, and his gospel is full of, his gospel, his book is full of um, really Jesus' teaching and Jesus' words. He says, brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. And let it grow. So when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete and needing nothing. And God wants to change us by allowing our endurance to grow. Our endurance grows through difficult challenges. And so we need to understand that God's redeeming our challenge, not just to get us through, but to cause us to thrive. And so we come out more whole. We go through a challenge. Some people come, never make it through. Some people come back to where they were and some people are better than they ever were. And I believe that's all about the decision that we make in the challenge. Jesus, I need you to strengthen me so I can overcome. Amen. You know. Psalm 84, what joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord. They've set their mind on pilgrimage. And then verse 7, they'll continue to go stronger. Each one will appear before God in Jerusalem. You know, Paul in Romans 8, can anything separate us from the love from God Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if trouble or calamity or we are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Sounds fairly drastic. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours. Or more, We are more than conquerors, it says in the New King James. I just want to uh, stop and pray for a second here because sometimes when we talk about wholeness, it can, we can feel it like we're reminded by some of the baggage we might be 
taking or carrying, and, and we can end up feeling actually demotivated. And I just want to pray for God's Spirit to come and heal us and move in our world. Because sometimes you, you know, when you're aware that you've got some baggage that you're dragging along and we get a bit possessive of our baggage and, and start to explain why we needed to pick a whole big pack to go hiking through Kangaroo Valley when really all we needed was a whole lot less. Today, if you're... Yeah, and you know, the thing is with baggage, it may not be your fault that you got the baggage, but it's our responsibility to get rid of the baggage. You understand the difference? A friend of mine broke his leg. It wasn't probably his fault that he broke his leg, but it was his responsibility to do what was necessary to fix his leg. So there's a difference between blame and responsibility. And the thing is, the thing is that Jesus' power is so powerful for us. Today, just close your eyes for a second. If today you're saying, Lord, I'm just going to surrender that baggage to you. I'm just making a decision right now. It could be unforgiveness. It could be poor self-esteem. It could be insecurity. It could be all sorts of stuff. You just lift your hand as a response to Jesus. That's all it is. No one's looking around. Lord, today we're just letting go of that baggage. Lord, we don't condemn ourselves. We're not angry with ourselves. We're just releasing that to you. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your power that changes us into a new person. Lord, we pray. We surrender our mind to you. Lord, change the way we think about you, about God, about our opportunities, about ourselves. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Second thing is we need to dump the sin. We need the power of repentance. We're not really don't like to talk about repentance much. We'd like to talk about God's unconditional love for us and Jesus loves you just the way you are, which is absolutely true. But do you understand that there is the the gospel that involves me going, okay, I was going this way, now I'm going to go this way. Apparently when I was a small boy, my family were talking about repentance in the car. This is how Christian my family was. And I said, and I just piped up from the back seat, means change your mind and direction. And uh, that's pretty good. That'll work. And uh, if I'm heading this way and it's all about me, I've got to head this way and it's all about him. And and repentance is a big deal. And what we need to understand as followers of Jesus, our sin is actually not an asset. It's just not how much sin can I keep in in the backpack and still be on the kangaroo valley hiking trip it's uh, it's it's you know we need to get rid of that thing and repentance is literally i'm dethroning me and jesus what do you want me to do who do you want me to be how do you want me to think what do you want me to value i'm going to do that and so it's not about jesus you want to take that are you kind of no jesus here it is and repentance is right the first sermon ever peter's preaching away and everyone says, says well peter get to it what do we have to do oh okay repent you know we we that We've got to turn around. We need to understand that sin holds us up. And what we do is we inflict our sin on our kids, on our environment, on our spouses. And we've all got it, okay? Like, if we've all got this. See, repentance isn't an event that happened way back when. It's a posture. So I'm just living going, God, I'm a long way from where I need to be. I'm just turning to you. I'm a long way. I, I, I'm not, it's not like, oh, I repented 20 years ago. Well, that's good. I had a shower last week. <laughs> you might want to have another one, Jeff. Oh, no, I'll be good. I did that. <laughs> it's like forgiveness. There's also a posture. So many times I talk to people, no, I've forgiven my dad, the mongrel. <laughs> I don't know if you're allowed to say mongrel in New Zealand. It just means a dog that's not purebred. (laughs) These people here, I've been hearing about their dog action. They get lots and lots of them and they all die. So So it's very traumatic for them. So you could go and minister to them afterwards and just pray for the healing and the wholeness. Um, I don't know if they're going to repent of buying dogs, but... uh... (laughs) Friends, we need to be repentant. Coming back to Jesus, say, Jesus, that wasn't flash. I just released that to you. Jesus, heal my life so I don't have to need to do that. Jesus, be changing me into a new person. And lastly, it says, how do we do this? We run with endurance the race set before us. How? By fixing our eyes on Jesus. See, the thing is, right, um, we fix our eyes on Jesus, not on our mentors, because our mentors are going to let us down. All right? But there's so much we can learn. We fix our eyes on Jesus, not our brokenness, because if I focus on my brokenness, you know, look inside yourself, all of those really lovely songs, it's just, if I look inside myself, I find inadequacy and insecurity. So that's not helping me. So I fix my eyes on Jesus, not my lack, not my brokenness, not my... I fix my eyes 
than Jesus, not the things that I really want to hang on to. Because we, we run with endurance by fixing our eyes on Jesus. That's been my theme for all this year. I love reading the narrative of the gospel. Just the narrative. Just imagine myself. It's a movie for me. I'm the Apostle Peter. And Jesus is doing his thing. I'm front row. I'm thinking, yeah, go Jesus. So cool. Jesus had cool things to say to people who were trying to trick him. He, you know, he healed people and talked to people, hung out with people that people didn't think he should be with. And So I want to learn out what did Jesus say, what did Jesus not say. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus not do? How did Jesus respond? When did Jesus not respond? How do I walk in an ambiguous situation? Well, how did Jesus walk in his ambiguous situation? I just want to fix my eyes on Jesus. I want to get my eyes up past my baggage. Just Jesus, I want to see you. And when I do that, it shifts me. When I get too concerned with fixing me, I can become, it can become a, a spiral. But when I fix my eyes on Jesus, Jesus, I just want you. I just want to spend some time worshipping you. I want to value you. All of a sudden it starts to shift my heart, which changes my life. See, wholeness doesn't come by looking at my brokenness. Wholeness comes from looking at Jesus. Repentance doesn't come from looking at my sin and loathing my sin. It comes from looking at Jesus. In fact, shame is the best thing ever to hold you in your sin. And shame just locks us where we are. Because shame doesn't say you're a bad person. You did a bad thing, sorry. Shame says you're a bad person, which is a very different thing. And so if I've decided I'm a bad person, then what am I going to do? I'm going to do what bad people do. And so we need to understand Jesus came to lift shame. And we focus on Jesus. A personal relationship with Jesus is where it all starts. But we get to do life with Jesus. And it's amazing to me. It's astonishing to me that Jesus came in the first place. It's absolutely astonishing to me that he hangs out with me. You know, through the, the person of the Holy Spirit, I've got the indwelling presence of Jesus. And he wants to talk to me in the morning. There's lots of people who don't want to talk to me in the morning, but Jesus does. <laughs> and he's just keen to, to hang out with me and he listen, listens to what I say. Imagine, because he's got so much to learn from me, clearly. I'm like, why does Jesus hang out with us? Have you ever considered that? And we're telling him all our problems and he's going, oh, really? Oh, wow, I hadn't seen that before. And uh, hey, when you're praying to Jesus, by the way, don't pray prayers to impress Jesus. He knows. Yeah. Okay, so I'm filtering my thoughts. I'm going to just tell him this. And Jesus is going, oh, this is pretty funny. Like uh, this small person was doing stuff here. Yeah, see them have tantrums? I do that. I just do it better. <laughs> God loves you just as you are. So bring the whole thing to him. Eyes on Jesus. Jesus, here I am. This is my challenge. This is what I'm struggling with. This is what I'm believing for. I just need you. You know, um, I can't remember where I heard this just recently. But it um, talks about, you know, when we need to understand how dependent on Jesus we are. And uh, this person, whoever it was I was listening to, was saying he wants to get to heaven and talk to the thief that was on the cross with Jesus. And just say, how did that unwrap for you? you know, how did that go? Imagine getting to, to the gate and Peter's there and he goes, so, do you understand justification by faith? Mm, not really. I don't know that. Do you understand, you know, what did you do? What, talk about your life. Oh, not, not much good. Not much good. So why are you here? Oh, I don't know why I'm here. I'm just here because the man on the other cross said I could come. And I just, I was thinking about this this morning. I was doing my Bible reading overlooking mango white heads. It's lovely. Everything there is lovely. And um, I was just thinking, I'm only here because the man on the cross said I could come. Yeah. You know, when, when I get there and the boss says, why should I let you in? I said, well, because you told me I could come. And I feel like I've been given a ticket to a party that I shouldn't really be at, which is exactly what it is. And today, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, it's not about how good you are, it's not about how whole you are, it's not about how special you are, it's not about what you've done, it's because the man on the cross said you could come, which is awesome. The man on the cross said we could come. And if you don't have a personal relationship, maybe you've never personally said yes to Jesus, or perhaps today you realise that Jesus is, your eyes have just sort of shifted off Jesus and there are all sorts of other things. But if we want to run with endurance, if we want to just keep going strong, we need our eyes on Jesus. And some of us just need to get going, maybe get going again or get going, start up and just surrender our life to Jesus. So what I'd like us to do is just take a moment to respond. So 
If we could close our eyes, I'm not sure quite how you do that here, but if you, this is just between you and God now, because when you close your eyes, you know like every two-year-old that the whole room disappears. And it's just you and Jesus now. And this is a response moment. Today, if you're responding to Jesus, perhaps for the first time, or coming back into relationship with him, reconnecting with him, recalibrating your life and your relationship with him, we're going to pray a prayer together. A simple prayer of surrendering our life to Jesus. And if you're today here and your relationship with God is just white hot, going fantastic, then of course you want to re-surrender your life to Jesus. So as a room, we're going to pray this prayer with passion. A simple prayer of surrendering our life to Jesus, of choosing to look to Jesus, fix our eyes on Jesus again this morning. So let's, I reckon let's stand up. It's good to pray standing up because you know you're not asleep. Let's pray together. Let's pray with some passion, church. Dear Lord Jesus, this is my decision to surrender my life to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying in my place. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for accepting me. I choose to live my life in relationship with you. Amen. If that prayer was a, a page turn for you, then we have the next steps lounge. Is that at the back there? The desk at the back there. And uh, we'd love to catch up with you. We'd love to give you a Bible if you haven't got a Bible. I'm assuming they've got a Bible. If you haven't, I'll, I'll see me. I'll hook you up. And um, we'd love to pray with you and talk about your next step in following Jesus. Because following Jesus is not an event. It's a relationship. And that's tremendous. You guys.